everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to Osteobytes. Thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate um, your spending an hour with us. Um, my name is Christina Iptoma, and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dylan and Director of Scientific Programs at MIB Agents. And today on Osteobytes, we are talking with Dr. Aaron Murphy about stereotactic body radiation therapy, SBRT, and stereotactic radiosurgery, SRS for sarcoma. Thanks so much, Dr. Murphy, for joining us on Osteobytes today. We're thrilled to have you. And um, thank you also to our panelists, Vicki and Walker, for joining us today. Both Vicki and Walker are Osteo Warriors, and they are also the president and vice president, respectively, of our MIB Agents Junior Advisory Board for 2023. Thanks, guys, for being with us today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to share a little bit about our guest, who we're so excited to have on today. I've been wanting to get her on Osteobytes for a while. Dr. Murphy is an associate professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Cleveland Clinic. She completed her residency at the Cleveland Clinic and a fellowship in pediatric radiation oncology at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. She specializes in radiotherapy and radiosurgery for brain tumors and pediatric tumors and is passionate about using aggressive local tools while maintaining quality of life for her patients. Welcome, Dr. Murphy, and welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, everyone, please feel free to add any questions that you have for um, Dr. Murphy to the Q&A, and we'll make sure we ask those. Um, and before we get started, I have a couple reminders about FACTOR, which is our annual osteosarcoma conference. Um, registration is now open, and it is June 22nd to 24th in Hotlanta in Georgia. Um, and if you listen to Osteobites frequently, you're probably thinking that I talk about FACTOR a lot which is true, but um, if you have a tenant factor, you would probably be talking about it a lot too. So um, you've got to come for yourself and see what it's all about. Um, we also have a limited number of factor travel awards that are sponsored by our MIB agents family funds and special consideration will be given to young investigators um, and also attendees from outside the US. But any research or clinician is eligible. So please do consider applying. Applications are due April 7th. And we are very grateful to the sponsor of this episode, the Osteosarcoma Institute, OSI, is a nonprofit organization led by osteosarcoma experts from top U.S. cancer centers and together are concentrating on the cure for osteosarcoma. The mission of the OSI is to dramatically increase treatment options and survival rates in osteosarcoma patients through identifying and funding the most promising and breakthrough osteosarcoma clinical trials and science. And in addition to advancing research, OSI also provides a free resource called OSI Connect for osteosarcoma patients. Their osteosarcoma experts can discuss available treatments, possible side effects, and provide helpful advice for getting the most out of your visits with your treating physician. This resource is available in English and Spanish and aims to help patients and families find answers to their questions. So thank you, OSI. Um, let's see, Walker, can I hand it over to you to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Walker. I'm the vice president of the Junior Advisory Board and uh, Osteo Warrior, diagnosed in 2018 and at ADD since 2020. Vicki, you can take it from there. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Vicki Hoy, and I'm the president of the Junior Advisory Board, uh, diagnosed in July of 2021, and I finished treatment in May of 2022. Uh, and I'm so excited for you to join us today, Dr. Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's an honor to be invited. Honestly, it's so cool to be a part of this panel with Christina, who I know works so hard for Osteobites and pushing the mission forward. And Vicki and Walker, I think it's so cool that you are jumping right in and trying to um, be involved and help others. Um, so it's an honor. I, I'm going to go talk to all of you guys today about um, the role for uh, radiotherapy for osteosarcoma. Um, it's something that obviously is not talked about a ton. It's not unusual when I meet folks kind of deeper into their journey with osteosarcoma that they've never met with a radiation oncologist. Um, why that typically is, is that we think of osteosarcoma as being uh, relatively um, resistant to conventional radiation therapy. That's why, as you all know, chemotherapy and surgery are the primary tools to look after osteosarcoma. Um, but so 
if we had to use conventional radiation therapy for osteosarcoma, it would be something typically delivered every day, Monday through Friday, with the same kind of low dose of radiation to the same area over even about seven weeks if you're trying to get in enough dose to control osteosarcoma. As you can manage, imagine that would be a long process. Um, and certainly there can be more lingering fatigue and side effects if someone's going through treatment every day, Monday through Friday for several weeks. Um, we do have a lot of great conventional tools of radiation and ways to um, shape our radiation beams and focus just on the tumor and carve dose away from the normal structures. But we're still limited by the dose that we can get in um, because of those normal structures. Um, Christina brought up a great question earlier when we were talking about, you know, there's all these different tools for radiation. How do we know what's what's best? And what I often tell when I meet folks is that we do have a lot of tools. We're blessed to have these tools and to have advanced technology. And sometimes it just comes down to kind of picking the right tool for the right situation. What I'm going to be talking with you about today is something that we refer to as radiosurgery or stereotactic body radiation therapy. Um, if you're cool, you call them SRS and SBRT. Essentially what those mean is just focused high-dose x-rays um, where we use multiple beams to aim at one area to kind of ablate or kill a tumor right where it's sitting. And I'm going to forward my slides here. Um, and I, I actually believe there's several benefits for, for younger patients um, for these tools. One of the main benefits is the fact that it's such a more like complex and precise treatment. We use high definition imaging, daily image guidance. There's always one of us radiation oncologists and a physicist right at the treatment table right before someone's getting treatment. Um, so it's a much more kind of complex delivery, but precise treatment. So we get in this high dose in just over one to five sessions. Um, and so this can really reduce, you know, for our super young patients, it can reduce anesthesia needs. There's less impact on daily routine and education. Um, and there's a much more um, quicker recovery when you're doing it like this um, because it really wears on folks less. Um, the way it works again is by utilizing multiple intersecting beams to deliver focused high dose radiation to a discrete volume. Um, this allows us to spare normal tissue with a sharp dose fall off, which is super important. Um, most, most folks diagnosed with sarcoma in general fall into that adolescent young adult category and you're still growing and developing normal tissues. And so this is one of the added benefit I think is even more important for our younger patients. Because we're getting in this super high dose over just one to five sessions, it can increase what we call the biologic effectiveness of this dose and ideally kind of overcome that radio resistance that we think of for osteosarcoma. <clears throat> Indications for using these kind of tools are unresectable disease, so if something cannot be surgically removed, if someone has localized recurrent disease, if someone has oligometastatic disease, meaning limited metastases, and there's even another way to use this tool that's not commonly used in adults, but is very appropriate for our younger patients with sarcoma, is that consolidation of metastases. What that means is that we initially, we would treat initially involved sites of metastatic disease with these high dose focused radiation treatments. Uh, and there really seems to be even sometimes a suggestion of an overall survival benefit if you aggressively treat all sites of metastatic disease. There is an extensive availability and clinical experience, but mostly in the adult setting. Um, so we need to do more for our younger patients um, to figure out how best to use these tools. It's certainly one of the reasons why some of our um, radiation oncologists that I talk to are not, um, not as open to considering these focused high-dose radiation tools. They, they often discuss that they are worried um, that they, we don't know t toxicities, we don't know how, how it can impact growing, growing and developing tissues. But again, with this sharp dose fall off, there can be less side effects and less late effects from using these tools. And Dr. Murphy, I'm just curious, you know, when you were describing the kind of more conventional um, 
RT that's been used where it's a lower dose um, over longer period of time. Mm -hmm. Is the main difference between that and the SBRT just the compressed timeline for that? Like, is it the same type of beams, the same type of tool? Is it a research? Sure. sure, that's, yeah, that, right. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so what's different about these tools because we're um, giving such a high dose over a short period of time is that we have to be um, highly precise and accurate when we deliver these tools. So we often obtain high definition MRIs to get the most updated um, information to draw out the targets and the normal tissues. We have to use advanced, what we call immobilization techniques. What that means is you can imagine when someone's on the treatment table, we don't want them to move. And so that we um, we have to um, oftentimes like put them in a cushion or we suck the air out of it and it forms tight to their body. Or sometimes we would make a face mask where we can cut out the eyes and the nose so that people can see during the treatment. If we're treating something in the lung, which is a moving target, we should do special techniques to either um, just treat someone when that when that target comes into the beams of radiation, when they're like deeply breathing in. So sometimes we do breath hold techniques or sometimes we do it in ways where we're actually watching for that motion to make sure we're always treating the tumor. Um, so it's, it's, it's a different, different technique in those ways. There are, so if you can see on the screen, um, what I'm showing you here, so this is a gamma knife machine. A gamma knife machine is specific only for treating, um, using radio surgery to the head. It brings up a point where in radio surgery is when we treat lesions in the head or spine. So it's kind of exactly the same approach as SBRT, but that's outside of the head and the spine. Then um, down here is a, is a regular, what we call linear accelerator machine. And so these machines can be adapted to deliver radio surgery, which makes it um, much more widely available. So the, many, many centers now have linear accelerators that are able to deliver this radiation dose in a very precise manner. So again, just, just lots of tools that we can use. And does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Great. Great. Um, and then, so next I'm just gonna jump into kind of the primary roles for using radio surgery or SBRT for osteosarcoma. Um, so this is where the majority of our experience actually comes is in treating folks with osteosarcoma and Ewing sarcoma and other sarcomas. So the major kind of indications or targets that we treat are um, tumors that have metastasized the spine. You can see an example here of um, a lesion in the vertebral body down in the lumbar spine that would be treated um, or what we call non-spine bone metastases. So this is something that certainly um, is a newer technique. So we've been doing what we call that spine radio surgery for many years now for adults who have metastatic disease to the spine. But when I'm thinking about treating younger folks and I want to use these high dose focus tools in other areas of the body, um, we refer to that as non-spine bone SBRT. So in, in this example, someone who had an osteosarcoma metastasized the right iliac bone. This is a part of their hip. Um, we were able to treat that with SBRT. And similar, the last example, again, is lung. Um, I feel blessed that I work at a center where I have um, leading world experts in doing lung SBRT, liver SBRT, spine SBRT, um, pancreas SBRT, but all in the adult setting. Um, but it really speaks to why I have a comfort level in looking after folks in, in doing these techniques, because you really need a good team around you. So we have... Um, specialized physicists who help us plan these and help us with the delivery. And then the therapists that also are um, very familiar with delivering these techniques. Next, I'm gonna jump into the um, background that's available for sarcoma SBRT. So there's certainly limited SBRT data, but I'll share with you today what's what's been more recently published and, and what we know now. Um, Again, getting in a high biologic effective dose of radiation can increase control in sarcoma. We know that patients with limited metastases in lung and bone are considered curable with aggressive therapy. Um, however, if they're not treated, they can usually be fatal within two years. 
There's really good data that comes from this International Registry of Lung Metastases. They looked at large numbers of patients with osteosarcoma and patients with soft tissue sarcoma. And what they looked at was the impact of metastectomy, meaning surgical remover, removal of their lung metastases. And you can see, you know, expected survival of, of two years just isn't, isn't good enough, right? And so when you're more aggressive and remove these lung metastases, you can get survivors further out. Um, other data that I'd like to share, it it's, comes from um, Ewing's sarcomas. There's a collaborative analysis in, from the Europeans where they looked at 120 patients who had metastatic Ewing's. They had to have metastases other than lung. Um, and so and it, they could have a lung and bone metastases. They looked at the role of local treatment. So in this setting, it was certainly the paper was published in 2010, so earlier um, techniques. And they considered local treatment either as um, surgery or radiation therapy. And what they found if they looked at local treatment, if it was not given to either the primary or the metastasis, then three-year event-free survival was 14%. If local treatment against surgery or radiation was given to either the primary or a metastasis, three-year run-free survival was just about the same. However, if you use local treatment for both the primary and the metastases, three-year event-free survival essentially doubled, again, showing an important role to kind of consolidate sites of metastatic disease. Um, therefore, this SPRT technique could have a significant impact on outcomes in patients who have unresectable metastatic disease. The, the early data about SBRT for both Ewing's and osteosarcoma came from the Mayo Clinic. It included just 14 patients with 27 lesions. Um, the, um, two thirds of the patients had osteosarcoma. Median age was 24. The median dose that was used, so we talk gray when we talk about radiation dose, it was 40 gray given over one to 10 fractions. However, you can see that there was quite a large range. When they, they were conservative and they wanted to think about when, when you're treating normal tissues. So we have normal ki tissue constraints that we know um, as radiation oncologists that, that keeps our dose to those normal tissues safe. And they wanted to be even more conservative. So if patients were younger or if they were getting concurrent chemotherapy, they were even tighter with those constraints. Um, when, we, when we talk about radiation, we talk about how are we going to target these tumors and oftentimes we know that there can be, beyond what we see on imaging, there can be microscopic invasion. That's what we call these CTV margins. So that's like a clinical target volume margin. Um, an early suggestion was to add at least a centimeter on that involved bone and just a half a centimeter on the soft tissue. Um, you can see, so this is, a, this is an early example of a patient, a six-year-old who had osteosarcoma, and you can see here, down here in this image, um, this is an, an axial contrast enhanced image um, of a metastasis to the sacral bone. Up here is, is his bladder. These are his hip bones. And you can see kind of the dose cloud. So where the high dose goes is in this red. And then once you're out here, you're out to half of the dose. They had a two-year median follow-up for survivors, and they show that local control, meaning the ability to stop these lesions from growing, was 85%. They did have two local failures, so it was in folks who had osteosarcoma lesions treated to 30 gray in three fractions. We'll get at this later, but I certainly think that we don't yet know what the best um, dose regimen is, and I think that we have to go higher for patients with osteosarcoma. Um, they had some kind of mild acute toxicities, but they did have some significant late grade three toxicities, meaning that these patients had to have more than just kind of medicine to help them get through that side effect. Again, this is early series, and sometimes when you're f using these techniques and you're kind of pioneering them, um, sometimes you have to be aggressive before you really realize where, where kind of the right balance is. Um, and so I'll just go through this pretty quick, but you can see, so this is a patient who had um, and an iliac bone metastasis treated. And in follow-up, you can see kind of inflammation in the muscle all around this bone. This patient received concurrent gemcitabine, uh, which we know is a radio 
sensitizer, meaning when you have gemcitabine on board and radiation, you kind of get more bang for the buck or get a synergistic effect. And sometimes you definitely want that, but you also have to be thoughtful um, when you're giving radiation in these shorter SBRT courses that you might have some more side effects. Dr. Murphy, could you talk a little bit more about that, about the different drug interactions? Because I know there are, um, like, so gemcitabine, that's interesting. I didn't realize that it was, um, because it it could be, like, good or bad, depending. Um, I've heard before, like, etoposide also might have, um, kind of stuff. Yes, yes. So etoposide, um, etoposide is something that you would think of more as, like, myelosuppressive, certainly. Um, it's not certainly something that we think of as having more of an impact when given with radiation. Um, you know, it's it's different when when you're giving conventional radiation, where you're giving kind of the same low dose, the same area every day, because in that setting, the normal tissues can kind of heal and recover in between each of those doses of radiation. So sometimes you can you can more get away with safely using some of these high synergistic chemotherapies. Um, and so, you know, I, one of the things I always say is that in order to deliver these tools appropriately and safely, it certainly comes down to a really important multidisciplinary discussion, especially with the oncologists about kind of what regimens folks are on and how we think about that um, to try to avoid toxicity. The blessing is just that sometimes if there's certain, certain medicines that we don't want folks on when they're getting these high dose treatments, the, the treatment's just given over a week. So that's the blessing too, is that it's not a long delay in continuing systemic therapy, which we know is also so important in folks who have metastatic disease. Got it. And on the previous slide, I think you had like chemo held for two weeks. Is that kind of generally the time period that you? So we, again, this was early. They they weren't sure about how to think through this. So you'll see as we go on um, talk about my protocol kind of at the end is I'm allowing any kind of standard chemotherapy that folks are on, allowing them to continue it. Um, We might pause it just for the one week while they're getting treatment rather than stop it for two weeks before and two weeks after. Because then if you think about that, that's like a month plus off of systemic treatment, which we don't want. It's also one of the reasons why we think that, you know, using these high dose radiation ablative tools um, benefit folks because you can imagine if someone has surgery, then there's a delay for well, appropriately for wound healing and that kind of thing. And that's when folks are often off of systemic therapy as well. So using these techniques can kind of allow folks to continue on their important other medications. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I love the questions. Keep them coming. Um, so this, I'm just showing you right here that the SBRT has actually been used in some prospective studies. Um, so far, it's been used in the setting of folks who have Ewing's, um, Ewing's sarcoma that are metastasized up front. What, on this study, COG study, which is now closed to accrual, those folks got 40 grain, five fractions of SBRT to all of their bony metastatic sites, less than five centimeters in size on their kind of initial studies. Um, and so I looked after folks who who were on this study, and I just have to sh- share that they tolerated these treatments so well. You know, if someone has many sites of bony metastases, the way we kind of planned it was we I would do like the simulation, which means the planning session for like two or three sites, do that treatment, do another planning session, do those treatments and kind of keep going. And folks tolerate it really, really well, um, which has been a real blessing. So hopefully we'll find information out from this study at some point because they're going to evaluate local control and side effects and that kind of thing. Um, and there's another trial of um, that's called SBRT1, which was a combined trial from the folks at Hopkins St. Jude in the Mayo Clinic, where they treated um, SBRT for sarcoma bony metastatic sites. Um, and they included um, any kind of sarcoma that was not rhabdomyosarcoma. You can see the age range there. So older than three and less than 40, and they treated up to five sites altogether. Here again, they held chemotherapy for two weeks, and the dose regimen was a sporty gray over five fractions. Um, This study has now been published, at least the early results, which I'll share with you here. Um, So again, not huge numbers. So they included 14 patients and 37 lesions. Follow-up wasn't that long yet, certainly less than a year. 
And but what they looked at, what we call local control by patient was 89% and by lesion was 95% because many of these patients were treated to multiple lesions. And here, here again gets to that fact about consolidating metastatic sites. Um, so you can see there's a, a column where yes, so if all of their metastatic sites were treated versus no in the next column, you could see a significant difference in what we call the PFS means progression-free survival. So 9.3 versus 3.7 uh, months. And the, the overall survival was not reached yet for those who had all their sites consolidated with SBRT versus those who did not. Um, again, they saw, they did see two patients experience grade three toxicity. So again, we're still learning about these techniques, right? Uh, one had osteonecrosis of like a femoral head and then went on to fracture three years later. And one had a esophagitis during treatment, which is kind of soreness with swallowing. These are the kind of Kaplan-Meier curves that talk about the um, consolidation benefit. So this is another kind of larger series. Um, it's kind of a retrospective collaboration that included 55 patients and a total of 107 non-lesions. They had about almost a year of clinical follow-up. And you can see here that most of the patients that they included had either osteosarcoma or Ewing sarcoma or other non-rhabdo um, soft tissue sarcomas. A lot of the patients were seen at the setting of recurrent disease and the majority of patients, 83%, had multiple metastases. Um, they, they kind of divided up what they call the intent or the reason or rationale why they were using SBRT. Actually, find it hard to do this. I, in our like planning software, you often, often have to pick one. But my intent when I'm doing SBRT is yes, to improve symptoms. But my goal of using SBRT is always durable local control, meaning lasting local control. Um, you can see, so they, they use a, a, a wide range of like dose regimens as well here. So a, a range of um, treatment re regimens. Um, when they looked at their results, if you look at PFS, which is progression free survival, at a year, um, there was about 20% who had not yet progressed. Um, so we, that just points to the fact that we still need to do better. And these folks may be having um, progression outside of where they were treated as well. When we, when we as a as a group in radiation oncologists like to think about you know how how successful were our tools, we have some now um, specific ways of of looking at or measuring um, their response on imaging. And what what this series found was that the rate of like a good response, so that's this is complete response up to stable disease, um, was much better when you're treating bony lesions rather than soft tissue lesions. Um, and the rate of that local control for the response was longer if you're treating just bony metastasis. Um, so I'll, I'll get into this a little bit, but I think that it's certainly interesting that we um, need to be more thoughtful in particular of how we look after soft tissue lesions. Um, when they looked at symptom response, they saw that two thirds of them approved, improved over time. Here again in this series, they had two um, late grade three toxicities. So one again was osteonecrosis of the distal radius, and one patient had a pneumonitis, which is inflammation of the lungs, treated with a steroid. Uh, and Dr. Murphy, on that chart, like where does where would lung come into uh, come into that? Come into this. So they they didn't separate it out from soft tissue. So. Lung um, lung lesions tend to do, at least in my own series, they tend to do really well when we treat them with SBRT. Um, I'll share with you, but it's it's. I think it comes down to comfort level. We're comfortable to give even higher doses in the lung when you're treating a very discrete metastases. And again, I think that blasting comes from the fact that we have a lot of experience of doing SBRT in the lung that comes from adults who have primary lung tumors. So we're able to even kind of push the dose when we're treating lesions in the lungs. So I think that they they do well with SBRT. Again, another great question. Um, so this this is how when they looked at like those who had um, 
local progression and try to get a sense of, you know, what was the impact of dose or targeting with radiation. They found that the majority failed in field. So half of the patients progressed right in the middle of where they were treated. I really believe this speaks to dose. Again, this series used a range of dosing and I think perhaps, you know, not using high enough dose. Um, and then this, this Kaplan-Meier curve here again shows you that the main thing that was significant for a local failure was, so this is, this is soft tissue lesions treated and this is the probability of local failure. So certainly much higher than if you're treating something just in the bone. For the 13 local failures not failed within the field, the majority had paraspinal disease extension. What that means is that, you know, if you're treating um, a lesion in the bone, it's that tumor is not just occupying that bony space, but it expands beyond that. And I think that's where we have to be more thoughtful about maybe adding a margin um, and making sure that we're not missing disease. So I'll share with you our own experience. Um, so I've been been blessed that I have an awesome pediatric oncology team that looks after actually a lot of folks who have um, sarcoma and they send a lot of them my way to see if they're appropriate for SBRT. Um, so as of 2020, the last time we did this analysis, we treated 42 patients and 138 lesions. Um, as you saw to this point, all the data of SBRT um, has really been grouping a wide range of sarcoma histologies together. And we certainly know that these are very different tumors. Um, even if you think about, you know, Ewing's and rhabdo myosarcoma, the radiation is kind of a standard tool for those up front because they respond better. And so I wanted to kind of look at, look at the lesions treated and divide them out by those that are more sensitive to radiation versus those that are more resistant, like osteosarcoma and synovial sarcoma. So um, we had a follow-up of just about 10, 10 months. And I'd like to highlight this here. So the median time from development of recurrence or metastatic disease to actually using SBRT was over a year. Um, and so these patients are heavily pretreated with a lot of different chemotherapy regimens. And I think considering these kind of, you know, high dose focused radiation tools earlier in their time course might make a lot of sense. You might be able to look after them before they start to develop symptoms or that kind of thing. So it's really something that I'm trying to get the word out there that it should be considered earlier in the time of course. Again, just like the series, oh, go ahead, question. Well, I was just going to ask, so given that, because it sounds like it could be really advantageous to try to treat earlier versus later. And so is what is, is there like a, a minimum um, lesion size that you would consider as being eligible for treatment and even a maximum? Yeah, yeah. So uh, most of the series are um, the cutoff, the maximum diameter that you're treating is less than five centimeters in size. You certainly can treat bigger lesions in that setting, though. Um, you might consider treating them more over 10 to 15 sessions than just five. Again, it all comes down to the normal tissues that are adjacent or right up against what we're treating. Um, as far as minimal size, the, the key for us is that we have to be able to see it, to aim at it. So sometimes people have like tiny, like two millimeter lesions in the lung. And we, because we're using this, these high dose treatments and we're using daily image guidance, we like to see what we're aiming at. And those are just too small to treat. So um, there is there is kind of a range that makes the most sense, but most metastases tend to fall into that. So for visible, like, is it? one centimeter or like with the... Oh, you, so when you when you think about so there's no exact cutoff, as I'm sure you're hearing, but when you think about um, if someone's getting PET scans for evaluation, a centimeter is about the size when you think of that it's evaluable by the PET scan, right? So oftentimes you see lesions, you don't know if they're um, actually cancer or something else, or they've been treated with chemotherapy. And so um, once things get to be about a centimeter in size, then the, the PET scan can be more accurate. As you know, it shows us increased metabolic activity. Um, and so if you see increased metabolic activity, you might think that it's more likely to be um, related to that cancer. And so what, one centimeter is kind of a good cutoff. We certainly treat smaller things, though, even in the lungs sometimes. So um, so there's not an exact um, black and white definition of small, smallest and largest.
So um, what we used here, so even I started off pretty conservative when I was treating these non-spine bone metastases because it was all new. Uh, when my when I was started doing it, my main thing was to cause no harm. And so I was doing kind of lower doses and now have been able to be more aggressive. Um, you can see here in our series, most of the lesions that we're treating were bony, um, extremity, spine, and other areas. A lot of lung lesions, one liver lesions, and some soft tissue lesions. Here's kind of the median doses that we used. You can see, so for the bony lesions, we're more on the 30 gray over four to five sessions. But in the lung and liver, we're already more comfortable pushing that dose higher. So um, when we look ask at... a question? Please, yeah. Sorry. Uh, it's just about, you mentioned lung, liver, and bone with adult lesions. And then, so do you treat any lesions on the kidney? So there's not, there, we haven't done, um, I personally have not done kidney SBRT. Um, oftentimes when um, the studying of like kidney tumors, people usually have like partial nephrectomies or surgery. It's something that we've used kind of in that same air area on the adrenal glands that sit above the kidneys. So um, sometimes folks who have like a primary lung cancer that can that can spread to lymph nodes or can spread to the adrenal glands. Sometimes if they have a focus that's causing them symptoms in that adrenal gland, you can do it safely. Um, so if someone had like an isolated metastasis in the kidney, um, it certainly could be done safely. Um, it just hasn't been used commonly. Um, so you can see here, so when we looked at our series, one year local control was just about two thirds um, from these initial patients being treated. So um, not as high as we would like. When we looked at all comers and just divided that into that more radio sensitive group, which would be Ewing's and rhabdo versus radio resistant, which would be osteosarcoma and synovial sarcoma, you can see essentially no difference. So we proceed perform this receiver oper operator characteristic curve to determine an optimal biologically effective dose. Um, so it's a lot of radiation terms, but um, it just gives us a way, a way to kind of calculate biologic dose for these tumors. And when we did this, we did find a significant cutoff. So when we found if patients had what we call that BED or biologic effective dose greater than or equal to 95 gray, they did significantly better for local control um, a five fraction regimen that's equal to that greater than or equal to 95 gray is 35 gray over five fractions. So one year local control was significantly better when you use those higher doses, 75 compared to 46%. When we looked at those more radio sensitive histologies, again, a significant divide. When you looked at the radio resistant histologies, you started to see a trend of difference, although it was not significant. One of the reasons why I think here is that we may not be using high enough doses for the more radio resistant tumors, um, but we're certainly finding a difference, which I, we've been able to finally publish this data so we can share it with folks that they know kind of what dose to aim for when you're looking to try to get a durable local control. Um, so we, so I, I found that in using SBRT for other diseases, when folks look at simple kind of what we call neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, so information that just comes from a CBC um, that can kind of reflect the patient's own immune status, um, that it could be a significant predictor of both survival and local control in the setting of SBRT. In, in this case, it was for lung cancer. So I so said, why don't I look at this in our own population of patients? And so we just looked at simple CBC with diff. We looked at it from different time points prior to SBRT, after SBRT, and at progression or last follow-up. And we found some significant variables, which I thought was really interesting. So we found that these variables were significantly detrimental to survival. If the folks had a higher ANC before SBRT or a higher neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio before or after SBRT. We also found that in, in patients who had local progression, that they had a significant rise in their neutrophil lymphocyte ratio um, at that time of progression. So what this speaks to and suggests is that maybe um, just following labs can give us a better understanding of how folks are doing 
sometimes when we look at imaging, um, it's not always clear whether someone has kind of inflammation or post-radiation effects rather than real progression. Um, and so it's nice that you might have a, an idea just from the CBCs. Um, so this kind of gives us, brings us to our clinical trial that we're able to just open. Um, and so just as a brief background, we know that doing these, you know, hypofractionated SBRT means those one to five doses can enhance the patient's own immune anti-tumor response. And we also know that the impact of SBRT on the immune system of patients with metastatic sarcoma hasn't really been identified clinically. We got that suggestion looking at our kind of retrospective data. And so we wanted to look at that in a more prospective kind of scheduled or planned manner. The patients that are eligible for this trial are patients 12 years and older who have metastatic or recurrent sarcoma and they're appropriate for treatment with SBRT. Um, again, systemic therapy is allowed. We're just kind of documenting what they're getting and whether it's myelosuppressive or impacts their, their cell counts or not. And treatment of multiple sites is allowed. Look, Dr. You know, Murphy, and the oh. slides coupled before about the, the ANC, the correlation yeah. ANC. Is there, so, I mean, for these patients, were some of them like treated with chemotherapy just prior, which would then have affected their care. No, yeah. So we, so that's why we want to, um, you know, I don't want, I want these folks to get their standard of care treatment, right? I don't want them to have to stop their systemic therapy. And that's why we are um, just going to categorize whether their their chemotherapy is considered a more myelosuppressive regimen versus not. Um, and so really what this might, this information from the study might show us is, you know, how, how does the, you know, chemotherapy and SBRT interact to impact the patient's immune system? Um, I don't think we're, we can look specifically just at the impact from SBRT since we're going to allow chemotherapy. Um, and certainly, so in this retrospective data, I mean, this, this was like labs checked anywhere, you know, a couple months before SBRT. So, so it wasn't um, as a regimented. So that's why we're going to look at it on a prospective study. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, of course. So this is the general kind of study schema. Um, so patients are consented for the trial, then they'll undergo their planning session for the SBRT. This is when we will collect labs. So my intent is not to take extra lab draws for folks as they go through this. So three of the lab collection time points are going to be at um, clinical standard of care time points. Um, so at this beginning, you know, before they start their radiation, we're doing the planning session, we're going to get one set of labs. And then I would also like to do quality of life assessments to really understand how are our tools of SVRT impacting folks quality of life. Then um, after you do the planning session for SVRT, it often starts about um, a week to 10 days later. So there's a lot of planning with um, targeting and the imaging and physics checks. So it's a separate cleaning session, and then you start about one week or 10 days later. I will, the second lab collection is going to be right after the SBRT or within the first two weeks. So when, when folks are in the clinic getting their last treatment, we'll often kind of get that lab then. And then at um, three to six months follow-up, again, labs and quality of life assessment. And then at one year follow-up, again, labs and quality of life assessments. And then at two years, just quality of life assessments. Um, we have a, an awesome um, cancer immunotherapy kind of center at, at, the, at the clinic and some really smart people who have um, these panels that they've developed that we can use. And so I'm going to be collecting labs for these immune and inflammatory panels that they're going to do a deep dive on. In addition to that, some more standard labs looking at CBC, albumin, LDH, and CRP. Um, and so the primary objective of the trial is to evaluate the impact of SBRT on the immune system for patients with metastatic or unresectable sarcoma. As secondary objectives, we're going to be looking at local control. I'm only going to use at least that BED of greater than or equal to 95 gray of SBRT for these patients. We're going to look at um, impact on toxicity from doing SBRT and then evaluate the impact of SBRT on the quality of life for our patients.
Bye. Any any questions about this trial so far before I get into something else? Uh, so sorry, on the 95 gray, so the bed of 95 gray, is that over, how do you determine um, like how many fractions that is or how many days? So if that's, so we typically for younger patients use this five fraction mm -hmm. regimen. And so that's getting at least 35 gray over five fractions is equivalent to this BED of greater than or equal to 95 gray. Sometimes if, you know, we'll, if it's like a holiday week or something like that, we try to work with it and you might get a higher dose per fraction just over four sessions or that kind of thing. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Peter's here. Um, so, so I, sh I shared this slide just to show you that we're, we're as a, as a group trying to, um, standardize how we do things a bit more. So. We now have these international CTV, which is that clinical target volume recommendations of how we kind of delineate or draw out um, the bone metastases that are not in the spine. Um, and you know, I, what's what's different about this is again, I said earlier that spine radio surgery is something that's very commonly done. When you treat lesions in the spine, obviously the spinal cord is the main kind of normal tissue of constraint that you're worried about. But here, when you're treating areas all over the patient's body, if you're really thoughtful about what normal tissues are close by, um, and we, ca we call those OARs or organs at risk. So just an example, and I'd like to share these slides when I'm giving, giving talks about SBRT for younger patients is that for, if you see here, you're treating this um, iliac wing metastases, you have to be really thoughtful about both skin, which ends right here, and the bowel, which is right here. Um, and then also I'd like to highlight that you got to think about things that are moving too and how you think about this. So this is someone, you can see this is someone's like, it's all zoomed in. So sorry, it's kind of hard to see the anatomy, but this is their, this is their heart. Sorry, I keep losing my marker here. It's their, it's their heart and their lung is the black. And then the target's drawn out in that kind of yellow and red. When you're treating rib lesions, you have to be thoughtful and monitor for movement. We call it an internal target volume. That's what an ITV is. So you guys are learning lots of lots of new terms today. But again, I highlight this just that you have to be thoughtful. And if something's moving, you have to think about how to incorporate that in your volume or whether you do some techniques to limit that movement. So this is one of my final slides I like to share. So the lessons learned so far, second that it says Ewing's, it should say um, SBRT in general, but it certainly can be challenging patient population to treat because um, folks have often received multiple prior therapies and are rarely have limited metastatic sites. I hope I've shown you today that durable local control is possible. I really believe that SBRT is well tolerated as long as we're thoughtful about the concurrent therapies and the total cumulative dose, you can certainly see more side effects if you're treating an area that has seen prior radiation. I don't think we know yet ideal dose or fractionation schemes and studies are needed. And this is something that's really exciting that I'm going to share the upcoming factor meeting. So I looked at, I meant to share this on earlier slides. I meant, I looked at just our folks that we had treated for osteosarcoma with SBRT and to try to get a sense of what, do we have a biologic dose cutoff that is more beneficial for local control. And just like when for all of those comers, it was 95 gray, I found a significant cutoff for osteosarcoma patients at 120 gray. So you have to push that it was higher to achieve the local control that you want. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me. So I think it's an exciting thing to kind of share with other folks who are going to be doing SBRT. Um, so we're going to share that information even more at the factor conference. Um, so the multidisciplinary team is critical. I feel really blessed that I have that um, to help identify appropriate patients and to incorporate these aggressive local treatments into the overall treatment plan. I want to share with you this one example here. Um, so this is a patient who has um, who had osteosarcoma and my, sorry, my screen is, there we go. Um, it was 15 year old female. She had a growing, uh, what we call pet avid left lower lung nodule. You can see it. So again, this is small. So this might've even been less than a centimeter, but it was 
enough that you can see that it was related to cancer because it was avid on the PET scan. She had multiple prior thoracotomies, meaning surgical remover of these metastases. But she was now focused on continuing the school. She wanted to continue chemotherapy. Um, she was looked after by Dr. Anderson. He switched her from Doxel to Pazopinib, which is something that's been used. It's also a radio sensitizer, but we actually have well, a good number of series showing that it's safe when we do when we use SPRT for these patients. And you can see here, so this picture is looking at her straight on. So you can see certainly. The, this blue is kind of the target value. Why that is, is that we watched the monitor for this lung lesion as it moved and it kind of moved up and down. And so because it was small and we were able to, you know, still safely treat it, this whole volume included that ITV or internal target volume. You can see, so the prescription dose was what we call 60 gray in five fractions. Um, and that 60 gray is, I know the picture is small, is the green line. And then even within there gets hot. So the red lines within there are 69 gray. You can see, so this is this is a picture image of the patient lying on the table. And this just shows you how those multiple beams of radiation all converge in that one spot to deliver this high dose focus treatment. At every four degrees, we can modulate that dose, meaning if there's something critical up here, we can bring it away and then bring it right back four degrees later. And that allows us to be so tight and conformal to this target. And then you can see here, so now she's probably more like a year out post this SBRT. It's no longer avid. You can kind of see this like fibrosis or scarring in the setting of SBRT. It's not something that folks are typically symptomatic from. And so then we just continue to follow them. So she did great. And I just a special thank you to our team. Again, it takes a, a large team to look after these patients. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Murphy. Um, clearly, you could tell we had so many questions, and we have a couple more it questions. Great. Yeah, yeah, from the audience. So um, we'll let Walker and Vicky take those. Yeah, I was just gonna. Oh, you got it. Okay, I'll I'll just do them in order. I'll get you after. Uh, someone asked, "What DNA repair enzymes are thought to convey uh, radiation resistance?" And then, what is the quality of the evidence which suggests radiation can induce them? So that's that's something out of my expertise wheelhouse for that radio resistant and um, DNA mechanisms. Um, but there's there's actually several um, several mechanisms for um, radio resistance. We also think that the more kind of chemotherapy exposure that some of these lesions get, the the more their resistance are to, um, and so they just become more um, more undifferentiated. Yeah, it can become harder to treat. But again, sorry, I don't have a great answer for that one. What's next, Vicky? Waiting for uh, Walker to ask the next question. Oh, what's next, Walker? Oh, oh. Uh, so, did you discuss any preclinical data, and then how well does murine or calving data correlate? So again, I'm not a I'm not a um, bench scientist, so I don't have an answer for that. Um, there's not there's not um, there's some. So when I was initially thinking about this and doing the background from for this trial, there certainly is um, data out there, more lab based data that shows that um, sarcomas can be impacted by patients' own immune system. And there's a lot of clinical data, preclinical data showing how SBRT, meaning high dose focused radiation, can kind of vamp up and excite the patient's own immune system. Um, what's interesting, some of the data shows that you can get more of an impact on the patient's immune system when you give the SBRT over fractions rather than giving it all in one high dose. It just kind of revs up the system even more. There's a lot of um, hope on what we call abscopal effect, which means that you're, you use radiation to treat one area, it revs up the patient's immune system, and then it can fight cancers throughout the body. Unfortunately, it's not come to fruition a ton. There's a lot of kind of like single series case reports that shows that what we call that abscopal effect um, can be possible, but it's not something that we've been able to kind of harness yet. 
uh, to be um, active clinically. Great questions, guys. Keep them coming. Um, just so happy that you're doing this study because I think that is, you know, like, I know a lot of people just say that, like, we think there might be this immune effect, but we don't have any data. So I'm so happy that you're opening this trial. And actually, is it is it already open for recruitment? It is. Yep, it is. Yep. Yeah. So um, so happy that you're doing this so that we'll actually have some. Yeah. Yeah. And people. I'm working with some really, really smart, like, immune scientist to help figure this out, which will be awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, honestly, we have, I feel like we need to have you on for another episode because we have so many questions, but we're, unfortunately, we're kind of out of time. But um, but uh, I was going to say, and as, as Dr. Murphy mentioned, she is going to be um, at Factor this year. So, um, and also Dr. Jenna Coxes from Cleveland Clinic will also be kind of presenting more on this work. So um, if you'd like to learn more about it, come to Factor and Lynn and you can hear about it live um, from both Dr. Fox and Dr. Evan Murphy. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, because I know also, you, no one would know, but I know you were not feeling your bestest today. So we appreciate the super effort to join yeah. us today. I'm just, I'm honored to be part of, part of this awesome group. I really think you guys are amazing and the work you're doing is so cool. I love how it's so patient focused too. And all these warriors are out there fighting. Um, also, I, yeah, I'm sorry for the distractions. I had one point I had three kids heads all around me being like, mommy, get me this, do this, do that. So there's still one right here. That's right. Mommy doesn't get to be quiet. Now for that <laughs> webinar and, you know, yeah. <laughs> Hi. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, but um, I appreciate no, it. it all, so. That's what we're all doing, right? Like we're all, we're all doing it. We're all doing it. Yes. Um, yeah. Then you, like, well, yeah. And you guys are in college doing this. I think that's so cool. So um, yeah, they're super well, busy. I don't know how they squeeze all this in with everything else. Like, yeah, I do, like, awesome. and, um, yeah. Dr. Murphy for making it better for pediatric sarcoma patients everywhere. And um, everyone, more information on this and all our osteobites can be found on YouTube, on our website at mibagents.org, and at your favorite podcast place on Spotify. Um, and we hope you can join us next week on March 30th. We're going to be talking with Dr. Claudia Benavente from UC Irvine. Her lab studies the RB pathway, which is altered in virtually every cancer, and controls the epigenetic events that control cell fate specification and differentiation in normal cells. And they are aiming to elucidate the relationship between cell, differenti cell differentiation and tumor genesis in the absence of the RB family. Um, and so she's going to be joining us to discuss her paper on UHRF1 overexpression promotes osteosarcoma metastasis through altered exosome production and AMPK SCMA3E suppression. You can find our osteobites lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have any ideas for future topics that you'd like to hear about, please share them with us at events at mibagents.org. Thank you again, Dr. Murphy, for up and to, to your kids for joining us today and Walker and Vicki, and for all of you for spending an hour with us today. Um, we hope to see you next week when we talk with uh, Dr. Benavente. Thank you everyone for joining us.